morning. Grace and peace to you in the name and in the power of our risen Christ. I greet you from the United States, specifically from the city of Raleigh in the state of North Carolina. I'm grateful for the opportunity to share with you again and to recapture the wonderful memories of having visited Port Elizabeth last year. I'm thankful to Reverend Senzo for the invitation. Today, I would like to draw our attention to two passages of scripture. The first one is in Joshua, the second chapter, verses 1 through 15. And the second is Hebrews, chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, and verse 6. And let's begin with the Joshua passage. Then Joshua, son of Nun, sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies, saying, go view the land, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab and spent the night there. The king of Jericho was told, some Israelites have come here tonight to search out the land. Then the king of Jericho sent orders to Rahab, bring out the men who have come to you, who entered your house for they have come only to search out the whole land. But the woman took the two men and hid them. Then she said, true, the men came to me, but I did not know where they came from. And when it was time to close the gate at dark, the men went out. Where they went, I do not know. Pursue them quickly, for you can overtake them. She had, however, brought them up to the roof and hidden them with the stalks of flax that she had laid out on the roof. So the men pursued them on the way to the Jordan as far as the fords. 
As soon as the pursuers had gone out, the gate was shut. Before they went to sleep, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that dread of you has taken on us and that all the inhabitants of the land melt in fear before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites that were beyond the Jordan to Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. As soon as we heard it, our hearts melted and there was no courage left in any of us because of you. The Lord your God is indeed God in heaven above and on earth below. Now then, since I have dealt kindly with you, swear to me by the Lord that you in turn will deal kindly with my family. Give me a sign of good faith that you will spare my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them and deliver our lives from death. The men said to her, our life for yours. If you do not tell this business of ours, then we will deal kindly and faithfully with you when the Lord gives us the land. Then she let them down by a rope through the window for her house was on the outer side of the city wall and she resided within the wall itself. And our second shorter passage is in Hebrews chapter 11. And it reads like this. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Indeed, by faith, our ancestors received approval. And then verse six, and without faith, it is impossible to please God for whoever would approach him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'd like for us to spend some time today talking about the topic, what to do when your back is against the wall. What to do when your back is against the wall. Let us pray. Eternal God, we thank you for this opportunity. We acknowledge that you are God. You are the God in above the heavens and below the earth. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you. In the name of Jesus the Christ, amen. For those of you who know anything about the civil rights movement in America, you likely have heard the name, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. It's perhaps likely viewed as the most recognizable name and face of the civil rights movement here in my country in America, and rightly so. We don't hear as much, however, about many of the unsung, lesser known persons of African descent who have made influential and key contributions to the cause of equality in America. One of those not as known persons who I believe deserves attention is a man by the name of Dr. Howard Thurman. Dr. Howard Thurman. Howard Thurman, the grandson of slaves, was a theologian, a preacher, a philosopher, a mystic, as well as a civil rights leader. In the 1940s, he was the first African-American pastor to travel to India and meet Mahatma Gandhi. And he was one of the persons who inspired and influenced Dr. Martin Luther King to merge Gandhi's philosophy of nonviolent resistance with the civil rights movement. In fact, recently it seems that more of Thurman's work is reemerging because of the relevance and timeliness of his views. The best example 
of the timelessness of Farman's views is captured in his best known work entitled Jesus and the Disinherited, which was published in 1949. In this book, Thurman wrestled with the issues black and poor people in America struggled, particularly as they dealt with what he called the wall of separation, the wall of separation that was related to discrimination and poverty. In the book, he raises this key question, quote, what do the teachings of Jesus have to say to those who stand at a moment in human history with their backs against the wall? The poor, the disinherited, the dispossessed, end quote. In fact, many people who have studied Thurman's prolific body of work point out that he never strayed far from his urgent metaphor of the wall. Indeed, in one of his later works, Thurman devotes most of the book to the issue of what he sees as metaphorical walls, walls that separate black and white, rich and poor, those who are alienated and abandoned, especially from and in the church. There are walls that separate all of us in some way or another. In fact, Thurman believes people who have become so conditioned to living behind the walls and those whose emotional security is dependent upon the stability of the walls are apt to be seized by a sense of panic if the walls are removed. Likewise, Thurman also believes that the walls that divide, no matter the situation, represent a spiritual condition. Walls are getting a lot of attention these days, physical walls as well as metaphorical walls. You probably have likely heard here in my country, there has been a lot of talk about walls, especially from the current president. His is a focus on building a wall as a way to provide a physical separation between countries and people who are other than American. Walls could be seen in so many places. Indeed, when I visited South Africa last year, I noticed the incredible number of walls and windows and door bars and gates. Many houses, many churches and businesses all have walls around them. I notice walls everywhere, no matter the area or the neighborhood. And it's not that I don't understand and appreciate the need for security that walls and gates provide. I do, even in an American context, as I grew up with burglar bars and gates in my own home that I grew up in. But I wonder if our reliance on physical walls somehow has affected our reliance on figurative and metaphorical walls and thus affected our spiritual condition. In other words, have we become so accustomed to the security of physical walls that we have less trust and faith in the God who was in charge of all walls, the God who is ultimately the maker of walls. So it is my interest in Howard Thurman's insight on walls, in addition to our seeming current fixation with all sorts of walls, that has made me consider another wall encounter, an encounter that we see in the wonderful story in today's Old Testament text at the wall of Jericho in ancient Canaan. In the text, we encounter a woman who the narrator describes as a prostitute. Some translations describe her as a harlot or a whore. And her house is located on the outer side of the city wall. And we are told that she is living within the wall itself. The woman's name is Rahab and we can likely make the case that she is a woman who has her back against the wall. Not only the physical wall, but the figurative or metaphorical wall as well. Rahab is an outsider's outsider, the most marginal of the marginal. Indeed, there were two different types of prostitutes during Rahab's times, those who were part of the temple rituals and those who, because of poverty, became prostitutes as a means of making money for survival. Scholars believe Rahab is the latter type of prostitute. Her back is against the wall. 
And it is likely because of her status as a prostitute that she resides at the city wall. She lived in Jericho. And for those of you who are familiar with the biblical story of Jericho, you remember it is where God caused the walls to ultimately come down. The walls in Jericho were a bit different than just plain old one-dimensional walls. As a matter of fact, there were two parallel walls separated by about 10 feet and connected intermittently by internal walls to divide the space into dwellings or storage areas. The storage areas could then be filled with rubble for extra fortification in times of siege. And it seems that Rahab's house was in the part of the wall where there were dwellings, which gave her access to the outside of the city wall. And likely because of her business, her trade, it gave her quick and ready access to customers. She occupied a strategic location in Jericho. Isn't it strange then that God in preparing the children of Israel to finally enter the promised land, a land they have pursued for so long, that the story of their conquest would include a woman like this? Why is the star of this narrative a poor prostitute and a foreign woman at that? Perhaps the question is similar to the one Thurman asks. What does the God of Israel have to do with a disinherited or dispossessed woman? One whose back is literally and figuratively against the wall. Can a woman like this be used by the God of Israel as an instrument for God's purposes? I believe Rahab's story shows us in a fascinating way that God can use those who the culture deems as disinherited, those who society says may be useless, those who believe their lives don't matter anymore, those who believe their voices don't matter anymore, those who might be divided or separated by metaphorical or physical walls. What we see from Rahab's example, I believe, is her courage to forsake her allegiance even to her Canaanite people and cleverly orchestrate a plan of escape for the spies and also negotiate a plan of escape for her and her family. More important, her courage is based on her ability to recognize and acknowledge the God of Israel, the God of the two spies, the Israelite spies who have come to survey the land. In a speech the narrator includes in this passage that is unusually long for a woman in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, Rahab prophetically tells the spies that God will indeed give them the land for which they have come for reconnaissance. And while the text is not clear as to why and how Rahab was moved to cross the theological border. What we do know is that Rahab staked her very life on that day on the God of Israel. Rahab demonstrated in the God of Israel and believed in the God of Israel against the odds. This part of the story ultimately ends with the spies and Joshua keeping their promise to Rahab and she and her family were saved. Apparently her part of the Jericho walls remained intact for the rescue. Later in Joshua, if you read further on in chapter six, the narrator tells us that Rahab the prostitute with her family and all who belonged to her, Joshua spared. And her family has lived in Israel ever since. So what are we to make of Rahab's story? I believe that God is telling us admonishing us to consider those whose backs are against the wall. Those who may feel as if they are the disinherited among us. Indeed, I suspect that in this period, this pandemic moment, many of us perhaps are feeling in many ways for a number of reasons that our backs are against the wall. If you currently have or have had your back against the wall, you felt abandoned or misunderstood 
or mischaracterized or disinherited or dispossessed. Know that God can still use you. God can use and deliver you in a mighty way. And if we needed more evidence of God's grace to Rahab, her story doesn't end in Jericho. We discover in Matthew's gospel an interesting nugget. Starting at the beginning of chapter one, it says this, an account of the genealogy of Jesus and in verse five, it goes on to say, and Salmon, the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. So that means Rahab stands in the lineage of Jesus, the Messiah. That's incredible. And equally incredible as Rahab in the lineage of Jesus is Rahab's legacy of what I call radical faith. In fact, the writer of Hebrews in chapter 11 in our second scripture passage mentions her as one of two women, Sarah being the other, in the list of examples of faith in that chapter called the heroes of faith. We see Rahab mentioned in verse 31 and it says this, by faith the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. And it is clear that Rahab's faith, her faith and belief in the God of Israel, her willingness to risk her life to be saved by the, by the spies is at the heart of this story. Notwithstanding her situation, notwithstanding her status, notwithstanding her back being against the wall, she declared to the spies that she knew that the Lord God was the only God in heaven above and on the earth below. Rahab demonstrated her confidence that she and her family could be saved by the God she had likely only heard about. Her behavior reflected what the Hebrew writer describes in the first verse of chapter 11 as true faith. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. So Rahab seemed to rest in the confident assurance of what she could not see. She saw through the eyes of faith. Rahab's radical faith story is also captured incredibly in the epistle of James. Here the writer of James brings attention to Rahab's active faith. She not only demonstrated a confident faith, she demonstrated by her actions that she would act on what she believed. And she believed that through her actions, her family would be delivered even as the rest of Jericho would be destroyed. In the second chapter of James, which is the key part, the key section in the book of James, the writer mentions Rahab along with Abraham as examples of Old Testament ancestors with working faith. The writer of James goes further and says, likewise, what not, was not Rahab the prostitute also justified by works when she welcomed the messengers and sent them out by another road. For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is also dead. So then true faith, even radical faith, is trust in God for what we don't see, what we cannot always see. True faith, even radical faith, means an active working faith, not a dead faith. That is the kind of faith that the Hebrew writer proclaims is pleasing to God. That is the kind of faith each of us must have. I believe Rahab stands as a tribute to the possibilities, the faith possibilities within each of us. It seemingly did not matter to God what she was. Her faith, a faith that ultimately saved her family, launched her to what she could become through God. Finally, Howard Thurman reminds those whose backs are against the wall. He says that they will come to know this, and I quote, the contradictions of life are not ultimate. The disinherited will know for themselves that there is a spirit at work in life and in the hearts of men and women which is committed to overcoming the world. End quote. So those whose backs are against the wall, 
matter to God. Maybe you've never been in a situation where your back was against the wall, or maybe one day you will come to a place where you are wondering, God, where are you? Know that God through faith can use you and your wall situation for your growth and for God's glory. Is our faith strong enough, bold enough, active enough, confident enough to believe God can deliver when our backs are against the wall? Is our faith so radical that we can trust God enough, we can believe God enough for our deliverance when our backs are against the wall? Rahab had that kind of faith. May it be so for us as well. Amen.
Heals me when I'm broken, strength when 